So with that, any questions on yesterday's material? You mean in the lecture? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you have questions about the recitation material. We, we were having fairly long discussions yesterday about how to understand the question to do with grapevine. I think kind of, I don't know, this, I've talked to several people and people seem to more or less get the fundamentals of the system but not be clear what the question was asking. Well, the question is around res name resolution. Hmm. So the question, so in grapevine you need to resolve names, like we were talking about before with, with binding. And if you, th if you look at the algorithm that they use to actually control that, that service, the name service, Right, you have these distributed servers around, and then you have this way of, of doing updates, right, mm -hmm. if you do. And so the question is, um, in a system like Grapevine, what happens is you want something like name resolution to be fast, mm -hmm. right? So the typical case is you expect to optimize reads. Writes you expect to be sort of, far, you know, far and few between, so you're not really as concerned about optimizing those. Mm -hmm. So the question is around, um, is around Wanting you to explain, you know, what's to understand the algorithm well enough to know what's the worst case if you try to get, a, if you try to do a name resolution, um, in terms of how many steps it's going to take. Well, right. What wasn't clear to, to me was mm -hmm. what you, the previous, the first comment in the question about the difference between reads and updates had to do with this, because. So th this was it was a thing about reading and update, like it, it's a clue in essence. That if you if you're doing you mean the thing the comment that I just made? Well, in the question you you, you mentioned the difference in, in speed between um, the, mm -hmm. the typical read and right. an update. Um, and as far as the name as the as far as the resource location algorithm goes, you don't have to mention updating at all. Why not? Because you, you can you can update. I mean, what happens if you're trying to resolve a name and someone's updated somewhere else? Mm. But I think I think. Well, sometimes you can get the wrong answer, but... But you don't know it's the wrong answer. Yeah, well, well the okay. That is well, the, is the that word algorithm, I think, is problematic. If, okay. If you were saying, what's the worst that could happen as a result of this system? It's the worst case algorithm implies you'll achieve the same result, but it might take longer. Yeah, well, the, it's, okay, I see. Yeah, it's, what, what I want to know is, do you understand how the name resolution system works? And if you, and so what I want you to outline is not the easy case, which is the reads. Right, just because a read is, you know, you just go out there and get it and you're done. But what's the worst case that can happen? And so the clue there is that think about what happens if you're starting to do updates, you know, writes. Yeah. And so I want you to work through what happens if in the face of that and be able to explain how, what would happen if you started doing, because you can, and I'm allowing you to be arbitrary in the sense that you can choose what the worst case, you th what you think the worst case is, mm -hmm. but it'll have something to do with Updates. Okay, I understood yeah. worst case to be the worst, the worst read case, and so I completely misinterpreted your question. Well, it is the worst. It is the word no, read no, no, case. I mean the worst, because um, regardless of the issue of updates, there are sort of three different steps that you might have to go through to do a particular read, and I thought that your question was aimed at that. Okay. Well, the, when you do a read, if you, there are updates going on, that can all, that can. No, but that doesn't affect what those. Um, how uh, any particular server looking for, you know, the information to do with a particular name will actually go through the steps. Of okay. Trying to maybe maybe it's just maybe it's just the semantics were unclear. Like maybe. Well, but no, what you've just said means that I completely didn't understand what you were asking. Okay. Do you understand now? Um, yes, I think so. But, okay. Um, I've already written the paper and I'm not writing it. As long as you argue it well. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Other questions? Okay. The usual startup question, what's a network? Well, in our case, um, let's go back to our fundamentals. It's a system that contains at least two components that can communicate. But the very simplest case, very simplest case is just two components that communicate. Um, in an arbitrary case, it can be represented as a graph. Uh, the communication is done through point-to-point -point links in the network. And one of the properties that you'll see in almost any network is that there's some notion of links that are shared. In this case, this middle link is shared when between these two guys out here and, and the third one whenever they want to communicate to the other side of this network. 
Now, why would you want to share? What do you, what's, what's a good reason to share links? Otherwise, every node has to be connected to every node. And what's the problem with that? Why not connect every node to every node? What's that? It's going to get impossibly complicated. OK, it's going to be very, com well, it's going to be complicated. Well, uh, maybe. I mean, if, it's, if you could connect, I mean, if all of these were connected to each other, right, then wouldn't it be easy to send messages around the system, right? You just, you're, con you're connected to everything else. You can just. The complication is the connection, it's not, not the complication of sending messages. I mean, you mean the you physical? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's physical. So there's, but but that what that really translates into is cost, right? Actually getting these things out. I mean, stringing out all of these w cables, right? Is is pretty. The algorithm is pretty easy, right? You just you want to go from point A to every other point. The hard part is it's going to cost you a fortune. It's just un it's just untenable. It doesn't scale. Um, so instead, what we do? What's that? So instead, of what we do is we share links. And in the case of the internet, you have these big trunks that run across the country or between uh, geographical areas. Now, what's, what tr what's the trade-off when you start sharing links? Reliability. Well, you have reliability, so there's more points. There, there's, you know, there's failure points, right? You can have redundancy to try to, to counteract that. But more generally, what's the trade-off? Well, the, those are specific ones. I mean, just like think of. The, the high, at the highest level, I have less links. What, what about how does it, what, what does that introduce? What notion? This is a, this is a weird one because it's I listed several. Well, I'll just give you the answer. Complexity. Now the weird the weird p reason of thing, thing about this is that complexity. Remember before we were saying that the more interconnections there were, usually the more complex it was, right? In this case, in networks, it's counterintuitive because the less that you have, the more complex it is. And the reason it's more complex is because you want to build things in like reliability at, at some point. You want to be able to um, have some kind of redundancy and you have to ha be able to route messages throughout this, this interconnect now. And whereas before it was very easy to route, you just send, if, if you were fully interconnected, you just send it from point A to point B and you're done. Um, so there's, an in, there's, there's complexity that comes in. A bit counterintuitive, but like we said, you know, there's always exceptions to the rules. Right. And I'm sure there's a way you could draw a picture of those so that they have more connections as a yeah. result of Well, it's, used, right, it's using the network. So the co because you're bringing the cost down, then using the network becomes, and actually implementing the, you know, the protocols, et cetera, becomes more complicated. That's the trade-off. And that's a lot, there's a lot of complexity in, involved in that, which is why networking is a field, subfield all in its own. So let's look at a couple different types of networks. Um, one of them is the, that you may... Uh, be familiar with is called an asynchronous network. Has anyone heard of this before? Asynchronous network. Let me give you an example of one of these. You have a link, and along each link, what you have are messages that are fixed length, um, certain certain number of bits, however you want to measure the length. Um, one way to measure it is actually to say that these these are uh, these messages uh, are go out on this line at regular intervals. So you know, let's say one millisecond. And the idea here is that when you communicate over this link, the reason it's called asynchronous is that when you communicate over this link, you have to establish a connection. And what this connection is, it's sometimes called a circuit or a session. This connection says is that I can take every, so you divide this thing into say, say there's 20 of these, you can say I can take every 20th one of these is mine. However, wh however you decide to divide this, maybe you say every 20th and 21st is mine, but the, in, essence, in essence what you're doing is you're reserving some number of these packets for your connection between these two points. And once you've established that connection, then you can start sending or receiving data.
And then when you're done, you tear down the connection. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that you'll notice is these two steps here will will uh, will not only take some will cost you some overhead, but also what can happen at this point here? Is this always guaranteed to work? Okay, no. Why not? Well, if all 20 of the pa packets in the cycle are already being used, then there's no place to squeeze in another one. Right. So you can, if, 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 all, if the resource is all being used by other connections, what do you get back? A busy signal. Right? This, this resource is, being, is completely used. So in this case, whenever you try to establish a connection, it's very binary. Either you get it or you don't, and that's it. Um, what type of network is uh, generally asynchronous out there that you use all the time? Phone. Right, this works great for a phone. You pick it up, when the dial tone shows up, that means that you have at least a connection to your, to your local, you know, whatever your local, um, whoever provides your uh, dial tone locally. When you type in a number, right, that system, whether it be your corporate, you know, PBX or, you know, some AT&T hub somewhere, or, or Baby Bell hub, um, will go out and try to, to get, to, to reserve, to, to build connections between uh, its network and wherever else it's going, if you're especially if you're dialing international, can be an issue. But once that's set up, the idea is that you, you have that connection, it's yours, you can start sending your voice data over that. Yes? I don't get how the concept of every 20th packet is yours. Like, what are the other 19 packets, and how is that fluid? So in the phone system, for example, these packets, this is set up so that the number of packets that you get correspond to, I think it's something like four, Four kilohertz. It's some it's some amount of bandwidth that you get on the line, mm -hmm. and so what that means is that it's enough for you to communicate voice back and forth. And the way they divide this resource, which are these links, is that way they say this link has a capacity to carry, you know, 20. Let's say to, just to pick a number, 20 uh, voice uh, conversations at once. So what we're going to do is divide this into 20 slots. And then that way, whenever somebody new comes, we give them that 1 20th of that resource. And then when it fills up, then you get a busy signal on that particular connection. Oh, so that's more a concept of division of space as opposed to division of time, sending it out one second, then one second. Well, this actually, there's a technique called time division multiplexing. And that's a perfectly fine way to do this. I mean, a lot of times your, your conversations are actually disjoint. I mean, this is, how, this is one of the reasons cell phones I mean, they use this time division multiplexing, the digital ones. This is one reason that they can use less power, because they're not, unlike the analog ones, they're not always on. They're just spurting out little packets, like boom, 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 boom. And so they don't have to, because they don't have to be on all the time, then they don't have to you know, power up their antenna all the time. So a time division multiplexing does have its uses, um, and it's a common, common technique, especially in these kinds of, of networks. Yes. Is there a synchronization pulse? Just say what it means that the 20th packet is mine. Um, there can be there can be a synchronization pulse. Um, there's different ways to, to to implement these things. Depends on what the length of the of the cable is. Um, depends on whether you can have uh, you know any, whether you're local or global. The more global you are, the more you need some kind of synchronization pulses. If you're local, you you may not. Um, but that is that's a perfectly valid implementation for certain situations. Is to have some kind of some kind of pulse that tells you that well, gives or even even just to say what do you mean by the twentieth packet is mine? Twentieth in regards to who what's the zero packet? Oh the um so the 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 uh, starting and ending points mm -hmm. when you establish a connection you reserve that packet as belonging with an ID or something as belonging to to you, to your particular phone. So for example if you have a phone out here and you're and you and you're dialing into this hub, when you come in here this hub you know, these, these days are, tend to be written in software. We'll say, okay, I have a table here, and say it's 20, and then it goes through and says, okay, the first five are taken up. Now I'm going to be, you know, take up number six belongs to, you know, some somebody here, and that is associated with this phone, and then it can communicate that information over here, and that you know they can propagate out. But that both sides have to know that this this slot is being reserved. 
that's part of what establishing the connection is about. So one thing that, that brings up an important point, which is notice that this is that this connection requires you to maintain state. Okay, there's a state associated with this connection, which is here. So this is important because in the next one we'll see an example, and the internet is an example of a state, a, a, a system where you, a network where you don't need state. So just on the, on the phone thing, this concept of packets would only apply to digital networks. <coughs> Um, you can have analog working that way, um, and I mean, there's these this, these messages here on this link could be digital, could be analog, and in fact, at the lowest level, they're, they're probably pulses, analog pulses. Um, I mean, unless unless it's a fiber network where you're thinking about light and you consider that you know a pulse, but then again, it's analog, and at the end, it's, it's that's analog too. So it just it depends on what layer you're looking at it. At the lowest layer, I mean, everything's in the real world, it's, it's pretty much analog. Um, and But when you abstract it out, it can be digital. Like you say, the sixth one is the first one available, and then every 20th after that or something, that makes sense to me. But to say it's the ending packet, is that you just saying the next increment? The ending packet, I'm sorry. So it's starting an ending packet when, when, when you make a connection. Oh, when you make a connection, you so when you make a connection, what you have to do is first find which slot, find a slot that's available. So let's say you say slot number six is available. Um, what you do is you then use every, every time you have the sixth slot comes up, you say here's a message that I'm going to send out that corresponds to that connection. And then when that's, when that's done, there's, pro there's some special packet that you send to the other side or some other protocol that you may use to say, to tell this guy, let's tear down the, that connection. Then the whole con when the whole thing is done, then you just tear it down. Um, but you have to, so this has to maintain that state. When this one communicates to the next one, they have to maintain a state as to what, you know, what slot that's going to take up and so on all the way through. So there's a lot of state that you, that you're carrying in terms of what, what, how much, uh, how many resources that, or what, what type of resources that uh, connection is holding. Um, now, one interesting thing here is once you establish the connection, do you really need a source and destination address, some way of addressing this this packet? Yeah, and what about what about all the way through? You know, what about all the way whoops, through to its to its destination? Do I have to say does each does each message I say have to have to say? Well, I'm here in Cambridge and I'm calling, you know, Botswana. Does this ha does each packet have to have Botswana? Presumably, the, serv the servers along the way know know what to do with it instead. That's right. Each of them will have when you set up when you establish the connection. Each one of these is going to have a table like this. And so the, when you, the packet comes in here and says, oh, this is the one on number six. Over here might be the one on number 10. Over here might be the one on number 50. Over here might be the one on number two. Um, but all the way through, all that, that information about source and destination, it's, it's known by virtue of the fact that these tables are being stored at each point along the network. Yeah, and there are ways you might be able to address that. Uh, for example, you may say that if that every packet has to have a certain, even if there's no, no message, that that packet has to have something in it that's that's detected along the way. And if you don't receive, if after a certain number of packets you don't receive anything, you might just drop the connection. Um, but yeah, the, you do have to address that issue of how do you, you know, what how do you make sure that. If for some reason someone cuts this line, that all this, uh, everything down here that's in the rest of the network that's depend, that thinks that this connection is still there, you know, how, eventually it'll have to time out and, and give it up. Uh, but that, that is an issue in the, in the phone systems. How do you make sure all that gets propagated? And, and if two, to a server, two incoming lines come with slightly out of phase packets, you have to have digital delays to make them synchronize so that um, well, in this case, there's always the, the packets only travel uh, along one link at a time. A server would take many incoming lines. Yeah, it could take many. It could be connected to a lot of different, a lot of different ones. But they don't They don't need to be synchronized with each other. 
Um, they just, when, when they, the lines, each line has to be synchronized within itself. I mean, in the sense that you have to allocate these correctly, but they don't have to be synchronized. In fact, it'd be pretty difficult to synchronize all of them with, the, with each other. So if something comes in half a second, millisecond later than another incoming stream, and I need to route them both to the, into packets 10 and 12 of an outgoing stream, I need to do a time delay of one or? Yeah, you'll need to have a buffer. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually get into into that whole into buffering, um, because that is that is an important aspect of. of or I could just cut out a little of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they won't. <laughs> In fact, that's one of the great things about voice is you drop a packet here and there, and you know who who cares? You'll be able to tell what the rest of it is. Um, so, just summing up, here you get predictable predictable bandwidth. And you actually get a pretty good degree of reliability in the sense that once you establish the connection, you can assume that whenever you put some message into the first part of, you know, the beginning of it, it'll actually pop out at the other side with high degree of probability. Now let's look at a different type of network, which is an asynchronous network. It's probably the one that um, you've seen most often. Asynchronous? I don't know. Is Who's an English ISO? major? <laughs> you might be misspeaking of ISO, meaning the same. ISO, okay. Rather than ISO C. See, the Chomsky, no the Chomsky graduate comes to my rescue. I just mean something Greek, but A does, and so by now I'm sure ISO. Go Chomsky. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> Now, one thing, so let's look at an asynchronous network. Should have left this one up. Asynchronous network is different than an isynchronous network. In an asynchronous network, first of all, there's no explicit connections. So there's nothing about establishing and tearing down a connection. You just basically send. And at some point, you hope that something receives. OK. Um, one other difference is that in asynchronous, you have the, the packets, the messages you send can be variable length. Whereas over here, if you, especially if you did something like time division multiplexing, um, you're going to have each message be the same amount, which is fine for voice. Uh, but over here, you may have variable length. It may be a file. It may be just a bit of information. Now, because you're not establishing and tearing down a connection, there's the, you, each message has to have in some way associated with it a destination at the very least. And typically, you want also to include a source so that you can receive acknowledgments back if that's important to you, to have an acknowledgment that a message was received. Um, so you need addressing. And when, uh, whereas over here, uh, when you're sending something across a link here, um, you can you'll you'll know that the mess if, if you know that the message is going to be a certain a certain length, you can probably pre-process it into that length. Um, for the voice network, you can have some good idea of what's you know what a, a block size might be uh, to avoid processing down the down the way. In this asynchronous network, typically you don't know what's going to happen to your message. It could be broken down into lots of little pieces and, and all those at one point and all those pieces sent out. And you know, what you're hoping is that at the, at the end point here, at some point, it'll all be reconstituted into the, the original message that you sent. But there's no guarantees around that. Um, what was the, um, over here, you have pretty reasonable guarantee on latency. Whereas in an asynchronous network, there's no guarantee on latency. You can, it can be there lightning fast, or it may never get there. And that's what's called a best efforts network. So best efforts network, whereas, as, as opposed to one of these asynchronous ones, um, best efforts, the, the network will do whatever it can to try to, to, try to move the message along. Um, but there's no guarantees that, it'll, that the message will actually get there. Now, this type of, of network is, uh, is better, much better for bursty traffic. So traffic where, like for example, when you're web surfing, is bursty traffic, right? Because you click on something, and all of a sudden you get all this stuff, boom, 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 and then you wait for a while, right? You click on something, boom, 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 as opposed to something like voice, where it's typically 
very regular and you're expecting to, the conversation to keep going back and forth. Um, here, I mean, here, here you don't know, this network doesn't, can't expect to know when something, uh, a bunch of messages are going to come in or how long or how much, uh, or how, lo how long that the messages are going to be for during a burst. Casey, can I ask, mm -hmm. not exactly directly related, what about PC phoning? What, how does that work? PC phoning. So PC phoning is a way to try to, to, to simulate this on top of this. So what they do is, is, I mean, there, you have, there's all this, you know, fuzziness over here, but what you're trying, what you're hoping for is that there are paths from point A to point B that will have the kind of characteristics that you expect here. Now, it's not guaranteed. That's why when you, when you do PC phoning, sometimes you get these, these little, you know, clicks and dropouts and so on. Um, but there are ways to try to simulate this more effectively. Um, what you can do, what some companies do, and this is just an aside, is um, on this link, for example, suppose it's owned by um, GTE. Uh, GTE, you can go to GTE and you can say, uh, I'd love to, I know that this has, uh, you know, a bunch, of, a bunch of bandwidth on, you have a bunch of bandwidth on there. Can I buy a one megabit per second? of bandwidth on there. And this is what's called a transit agreement. And what you do is, is you say, any type of my packets come into your, to your at, at point here, your, your um, routing point, I want mine to be guaranteed that, that, they'll, that you'll at least be able to give me a, a megabit per second where no one else interferes with them. And if you do that along several major trunks or buy these transit agreements from several major providers, then you might be able to cover, you know, 80% of the broader internet. Um, so you can try to get established, um, established bandwidth guarantees and latency, more latency predictability uh, this way. And then all you have to worry about are the fringes, which is a big worry. But then your, you know, the problem in the middle here is mitigated. So that's the kind of thing you probably want to do is, is you know, try to build functionality on top of here that makes it look a little bit more like this. Presumably, that, that's why a lot of the internet phone things concentrate on international, because once you get to the fringes, if you're having real problems, you could just reconnect a circuit. Um, I actually think the reason they, they concentrate on international is because international phone, calling internationally is so expensive yes. uh, for a lot of countries. Um, I know, for example, that in Latin America, there's, there's still a lot of countries that have uh, where the phone company hasn't or the phone system hasn't deregulated yet. So these monopoly, you know, government-owned monopoly, monopolistic uh, phone company can charge whatever they want. However, they still have internet access. So this, you know, PC phone thing. If you're if you're paying a buck a minute to call Venezuela, and you, this PC phone thing costs you nothing, <laughs> or you know, or, or 3.95 a month, there's they're starting to charge for some of these these days. Then that's that's what you're going to choose. Um, so that I think I think that's actually the reason they they love the international more than the U.S. where you can get you know free 20 minutes or three or four cents a minute. Okay, other questions so far? We're going to start digging a little bit deeper into this here. Okay, so one of the types of asynchronous networks is called the store and forward. Okay, this is the internet is a storm forward network. And the way to think of it is you have a bunch of, you have an, uh, an interconnect. And I'll draw. That, that's probably geographically dispersed. Doesn't have to be. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, these these must be really exciting. <laughs> um, so what you have here, what you have here are uh, these squares represent what are called packet switches or packet switchers, and these other uh, these circles are, are computers that are connected at network access points. And the way this store and forward network works is computer injects a message into one of these, into the network. Uh, it goes to the nearest packet. You inject it usually directly into a packet switch or some kind of routing uh, hardware. And then that 
is responsible for getting it to the switch that one a switch that can reach the receiver and to deliver it to the receiver. So it's called store and forward because you inject it in, this guy gets it, forwards it on, you know, forwards it on, forwards it on, forwards it on, forwards it on, and then it gets received. Okay, does that, does everyone get that concept so far? Okay. Um, now, does it, reside, does it reside at any of these spots until it's received, or once they forward it, are they done with it? Once, once they forward it, they're, they're done with it. So, so why is it stored? I, I see the forward, but I don't. Well, well, we'll get to, well, you're getting right to the next point. So one of the things, so let me step back. These links here, they don't all have, they're not all the same. Okay, some of them might be high bandwidth links, some of them might be low bandwidth links. Independently, some might be high latency or low latency. Some at, this, at a certain moment in time may have a lot of traffic while others do not. So getting from one point of this network to the other point this is where the variableness comes in. You don't know what, how long it's going to take to get out there. There can be what are called queuing delays. Okay, and a queuing delay is how long a packet is held at any one point here before it's forwarded on uh, to the next uh, location. And there's this whole there's this branch of systems research called uh, queuing theory, where they actually take these and you've taken algorithms. So you can imagine this is just a graph, right? And you can start running all sorts of different algorithms about how to get you know, quick from one end to the other as quickly as possible. Um, so this is the, the, those are the kinds of things that these queuing theorists do. And there's a, a nice theory, and you'll see a little bit of that in the uh, Ethernet paper you're going to read, that shows that as you increase the load on this system, the queuing delays grow up, uh, go up without bounds. So if you think of this as the load on the system, so how many packets are being injected in, the utiliz or the utilization is another way to think about it. Um, and you think about this as a queuing delay in seconds, you'll see a behavior like this. Now this is why in this network you're not guaranteed any, you're not, you don't have any kind of latency guarantees. Now look at that opposed to over here. This is an all or nothing network. Right? You throw some, you try to get a, establish a connection, and either you get it or you don't. Over here, the trade-off is that you'll always be able to throw something in. Right? The question is, as long as you're connected, right? And you'll and and you know when you throw something in, the question is, will will something ever come out? So that that's the difference. One of the key differences between these two. Let's think about that a little bit more. And that's a term that you'll see. I'm sure you've heard about people saying, oh, the network is congested. You know, what's, what's going on? So the way these work, and getting to the question that was asked before, was they typically have some buffer. And when, you, when someone injects a message, they'll say, OK, I'll, I'll, if, I, if, if, if I'm uncongested, um, there's all sorts of optimizations where you can receive the message and even start resending it out before you've finished receiving it. But that's the, the simple abstraction is you receive the message, you put it in the buffer, you see where it's headed, you figure out what the best route is out of here, and then you forward it on. Um, now, the problem comes is what happens when you're, this, this point here is getting so many messages, add more buffer, right? Just increase the buffer size. But that actually can be expensive, especially if you're retrofitting every one of these on the internet, right? And and when you're building one today, you know tomorrow's networks may, may your memory may be cheaper. You may want to put twice as much. So you're probably going to get a heterogeneous amount of buffer space in all of these points. So what's another thing you can do? Well, another thing you can do is start adding more more of these, right? But again, that's expensive. Because right, who's going to pay for all of those? You want, you know, do you, your phone bill might go up if, or someone's got to pay for all these things. Um, so what's the what's the least expensive thing that you can do when when you get a buffer overflow? Awesome. Just drop packets. <laughs> just just say, oh, I received it. Sorry, you know, <laughs> bye bye. Um, and you just drop them on the floor. And it, typically that's what these networks do. Is and that's what the internet will do is if, it, if it, you get a buffer overflow at any point, boom, gone. Next. 
Um, now that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. What that allows is this again. This is why you get this kind of behavior, and at some point you may not even get the guarantee that it comes out. Is that unlike this, you don't you don't get busy signals on the internet. What you get is drop packets. That's the trade-off. When the when the network is busy, you get drop packets. In this case, over here, when the network is busy, you, you just can't even you can't establish a connection. Period. So just a, a quick flashback. Remember when we were talking about um, design, design of the networks and, and how there's this end-to-end -end argument and how some people wanted to build sessions into the lowest layer of the Internet and some people said, no, 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 you know, we don't have to just build it as, you know, leave it as, as simple as possible, just make it this abstract, simple thing where you can build other stuff on top. Well, now do you have a better idea of why building sessions would have, would have hampered the expansion of the or hampered the expansion of the internet and made it feel very different right imagine even, i mean even in this case imagine you're you're going to amazon right and you click on something and then um, you know let's say you get a connection and boom you start well the U, the http for from amazon might have a url that points you to some advertisement or to something else and so if those don't work because it's busy then you know this whole model of of you know being able to have advertisements on Will, you know, would have failed from the beginning instead of later on as it, as it has. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that would. I mean, that's how a lot of services were funded to begin with, right? Where was this advertisement? Uh, there were these advertisements, um, and they've some of them have since been able to find other models. But that would have been very difficult to to have or to implement if you had this model where every advertisement had to establish a connection and then transmit a little. Little message and then tear it down. Yep. So, can I ask a dumb question? In practice, how do we see these drop packets when we're just surfing the internet? Like, what are the different ways that would manifest itself? Um, you actually don't tend to see them very explicitly, but um, because there because there's all sorts of protocols that are built on top to try to handle that. So, but let's take uh, for an example something where you can see it very clearly, which is um, video. Suppose that you're getting, you click on a video stream and you want some, you know, big old honking H, HDTV type of thing coming through. Um, well, if there's connections along the way, either through your ISP or maybe through your modem, um, where these, this data, these packets, there's not enough buffer space, they'll just get dropped. And so you might get frames that are dropped. You know, you'll, you'll see places where it just skips entire, you know, it could skip a second. I mean, who knows, what, depending on the, on the characteristics of the link. But that's where you can see it. A uh, place where you can, um, if you look more carefully, you can see it are things like FTP. If you're FTPing a large file over, you know, sometimes you'll see it going zzz, and it'll just stop for a little while. And zzz, sometimes that's caused by congestion, especially if you're on a higher speed link where you can suck it down very quickly. Well, if a lot of other people are trying to FTP over that high speed link also, then you, then you can get congestion. Mm -hmm. So, because remember, congestion happens when I mean, here you have your buffer, right? If you can send this stuff out really fast, then, then you're not going to overflow your buffer. So the problem happens when there's not enough bandwidth on these lines to send this stuff out. That's cause number one. Cause number two is when one of these other guys are congested, which could happen because there's not enough bandwidth on, right? And so you can see how, how congestion can actually propagate back through the network. So having just one single link between two big points is a, you know, is a recipe for congestion, bursty congestion. Right. So how, how does it work that some, some services seem to be very reliable? For example, email. It's, you don't see emails dropped anymore, really. So how, how what guarantees? Well, how do you know that you didn't get an email? That's really, really unusual, though. You know, I've never, ne I've never seen something that said you didn't receive this email. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, I don't know if it's unusual. And, and I, there was actually a study, oh, I'm trying to remember. There was a study that was done on email that was looking at how, you know, the re reliability of email. And it wasn't as, it wasn't, it wasn't 100%. It wasn't, I mean, it, it depended on the time of day, the, what you put in the email. I mean, if it's a simple text message, it has a lot greater probability of getting through. But if you have this big hunk of attachment on it, yeah, you know, but that said, um, you're right that there's been a lot of emphasis on trying to make email a lot very, extremely reliable, and uh, and that's we'll get to we'll get to where you where we, there's a, you, you think about that at a different layer in the network than this one usually, and there's a protocol like there's the SMTP protocol there's different protocols 
that do a lot of acknowledgments back and forth to try to make sure that everything gets through and resend packets if, if, they, uh, if they fail to get through. But that's, that's something that you build on top of something like this. And we're, we're going to get, I mean, you guys are all getting into the, to the next conversation, which is about layers. Um, and to introduce it, there's this big point down here, which is that, let's remember this end-to-end -end design principle. So we saw here how it could have affected us if we had tried to build in you know, reliability at this level of, of connections. It would have hosed us later on. Um, things like, Having a rely, things like building in any kind of reliability, like using acknowledgments or something at this lowest layer, could also impact us. Video is one of the, of the reasons why. If you're sending video through and a few packets are dropped, are you gonna are you gonna care about that? In, you know, to, you know if, if 100 milliseconds later, probably not. So there, you don't care. If things get dropped, they get dropped, and you're done. However, if you had built in reliability into this network. Imagine all the extra traffic that would be built up just sending these useless packets around. So at this level, you don't want to build that in because otherwise applications that actually don't care if packets get dropped are going to have to pay the penalty uh, for, for that functionality at this level. That said, let's talk about the concept of network layering. So the problem here is to reduce the complexity of dealing with a network. And the approach is layering. So layering was one of these um, approaches that we talked about uh, the first day, I believe. Right? There was hierarchy, there was um, abstraction, modularity, and there was layering over some other network layer, which in this case, we've just done one, which is the lowest one. And we still have the same old network underneath, uh, but the new layer is going to present a different, a different paradigm or a different protocol, a different way of interacting in that network. And a protocol is just a contract uh, by which every user on, on a network must abide. So some examples of these are TCP IP, um, which is really, in a sense, two, two protocols at different layers. Um, there's Apple Talk. There's the wireless uh, uh, 802.11b. A um, bunch of different protocols, but they can all, some of them can only act, interact with certain layers. This, this is a, a set of layers which was developed a while ago. Um, it's called the Open Systems Interconnection, the OSI layers. And this is a very general way of looking at a network. Uh, it's seven layers. At the very bottom, you have the physical layer, which is this, these are just where the circuits are, the circuits and the hardware, the raw, you know, the actual physical connection. And, some, uh, and this can be light. It can be, uh, it can be EM. Uh, on like microwaves and, and uh, over the over wire over the air. Examples of this are like the Ethernet. You'll be reading some of this, the Ethernet-based band signaling, which we'll be reading about, ISDN. On top of that, you build what's called the data link, and the data link is responsible for actually transmitting in that medium. So there's the physical link, which in essence is the medium. And then you have the data link, which is, here's how I think of the network as a way of transmitting packets back and forth uh, between nodes that are directly connected. So this is between two nodes that are directly connected. The physical layer is the medium. And then the network layer says, I mean, the data layer says, I, here's how I send, com, here's how I communicate bits or signals or messages back and forth on that. Now, that's just two things connected. The next layer up is the network layer. So that says, that's generalizing more to what we have here, which is you say you have a bunch of links, and each of each, if you just look at any two connected by one, there's a physical and a, and a uh, data layer there. And on top of that is the network, which looks at it as, if I inject a message into this network, it'll end up getting to the, hopefully getting to the other side. So at the network layer, you're thinking about things like routing, and, uh, and in this case, source and destination addresses over, over a, a, a larger network, not just between two points. The next four layers um, get into uh, more of the, on the application side. Um, there's a transport layer, which is, uh, this is where you start, instead of thinking of the, of the communications as packets, as you know, a set of, of bits that pack that sent, you start thinking of things more as messages. Like I want to send a message which is a an email header, or I want to send a message which is 
uh, a, an FT, some some kind of file. You start you start abstracting away the notion of that there you have to worry about packets. When you're programming at that level, you think more about I'm sending this message and I don't care how long it is. I'm just going to throw it in, and, and the other layers will handle trans transport of that. Uh, at this, the next layer up is called is the session layer, and that's where you worry about um, reliability and uh, of, of sending this. So, for example, if you want to make sure that this message gets from here to here, you, at the session layer is where you do things like acknowledgments back and forth, or try or, or whatever whatever you want to do to make sure that you know something gets over there as best it can, because there are no 100% guarantees in this type of network as for a message getting from point A to point B. Um, the presentation layer, that's where you, um, um, so that, that's where you, once you've got, once you know, once you have something like session type, session type information, that's where you start building higher level protocols like SSL. So the so secure sockets layer on the internet is a way that you um, can set up a, a connection that is secure right, between you and a bank or between you and a merchant. And then finally you get to the application layer. Which are things which are where you see all the high-level protocols like HTTP, FTP, SMTP. At that level, you're you're assuming that there's all this infrastructure below you. Like HTTP says, oh, okay, HTTPS. It's just using this secure this, S, this secure sockets layer, and I'll just be able to to assume that there's some abstraction there. And then there's stuff all the way down that implements it at some la at some at the lowest layer in terms of sending bits from one uh, location to the other. Uh, the reason I bring this up is uh, th this is it's very common. You'll, this model is very common. You'll see it in, in, in almost any networking text. Uh, when people talk about networking and when they talk about protocols, or the, they'll they'll tend to say, well, this is a transport layer protocol or this is a network layer protocol. They'll give the layer and say this is where it is. And if you have these in your mind and you have some idea of what they are, then you'll be able to understand what that, you know, what that protocol, why that protocol is there and how it fits into the overall context of things. One thing that, that uh, I mean, if you look at this whole seven layers thing, um, you can argue using end to end that that's too many layers, uh, and the way that you can argue that is to say, well, there's really three. There's the link layer, which is connecting, which is when you have two uh, components connecting them together and getting messages from one to the other. I mean, that's separated. That's really in the OSI. That's really the the physical and the data layers, right? But together, you can say, well, this is just a link, and and I'm going to abstract this as being able to send uh, data from one to, uh, component to the other. The next one is the network layer. Um, that one's still the same. It's to get packets from the source to a destination, uh, in this case, using a best efforts way. Uh, and then everything else above that, you can think of as more of an end-to-end -end type of, of layer, which is that not every application is going to want all four of the next layers. Some of them may say, well, all I care about is if I'm streaming, all I care about is looking at it very much like this, like this network here, with just with messages built in, because I don't care about if, if some packets don't get through, because if they don't, they're useless at that point. I don't care about a lot of different things, so I'm just going to look at it. I'm just going to get, instead of thinking about four different layers, I'm just going to look at it as, you know, here I am at this at, at this layer that's right above the network layer. Something else like HTTPS that uh, might actually want to think about some more layers. The reason you do this is so that if you by thinking about it this way, it allows you to overcome the problem, the performance issues. That if every imagine if every computer forced you to interact that through the network at the applications layer and forced you to go through all the other layers every time you sent something on the network. Then you'd have to pay the price for going through all that, even if you didn't need all those layers. So in the link layer, what's, how, do you, how do people actually implement these? Um, well, very generally, uh, if you think about signals going through here, you know, there'll be pulses, right? Just like you saw in the, the machine architecture stuff already. So you know, like ones and zeros. You'll have pulses. Now, what what happens when these this line gets long? What happens to these pulses? What's that? 
Yeah, they start attenuating, right? Because there's this, this, this is a, an actual physical. So they start looking less and less like this and more like something, something like that. And eventually they'll just, you won't even be able to detect them at the end. Um, so one thing that, that this implies, this is a physical characteristic of the link layer is that the length of the link and it's like, for example, in an Ethernet paper, you'll, this is a big, big uh, issue. The length of the link is, is, uh, is bounded. So you, you guys have heard, of, how many of you guys have, have put together a, a home network, like with cables and, okay. What, can you tell me something about these cables, how they're rated? How they're yeah, like, have you heard of category three, category five? Okay. So, okay. If you, um, if you actually, if you look at, if you go to the store to buy cables, these days, I mean, Category 5 is pretty cheap, but they're different types of cables, and they have to do with uh, what their performance characteristics are. So some of them, like Cat 5 cable, you can actually put a longer amount of that in between two points, whereas something like Cat 3 has, won't necessarily support the same bandwidth or length that Cat 5 and so on. So when you buy these cables, I mean, don't be fooled if one looks cheaper than the other, and they all both have the same connectors, right? There's 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 a real physical implication. How does the how does the one how does the other side actually read this stuff? Um, well, it does it by using something called a phase locked loop. And I don't know how many of you guys have done any kind of uh, intro to electrical engineering course, but a phase locked loop is is a very common type of circuit that's used in TVs. It's used in FM radios. It's it's, and what it does is it is it's able to take a stream that looks something like this and lock itself to it so that it can so that it can isolate in essence each of these different pulses. So it locks itself onto the frequency of the signal and to the phase of the signal that's coming in. And using a phased lock loop, then on the other side you can start you can take these signals and try to modulate them to try to make to, to figure out whether it's a zero or a one. Now the phase lock loop depends on there being transitions because it locks itself on transitions in the in the incoming uh, signal. So what you have to make sure is that these, however you encode your signal on this link, that you make it so that there's always transitions going on. Because if the minute you stop, like let's say if you just encoded zero as a, a set voltage on this line, then there's nothing for this phase lock loop to lock on, and eventually it'll lose, synch it'll lose its synchronization with the stream that's coming in. So one, so from a from a design point of view, one way to get around that, which is a very simple way, uh, is to say, well, I'm going to encode zero as zero one and one as one zero. So anytime I put a zero on this th on this link, I'm gonna it's gonna look like this. And uh, anytime I put a one on it, it's gonna look like this. So now we have we have these edges that the phase lock loop is gonna be able to lock onto to make sure that it that it's that it it knows the difference between different bits in this stream. Um, now what's one trade-off of doing this encoding? Right, you're using, you're cutting your effective bandwidth in half. Hey, because, but, so there's all sorts of tricks and, and what's that? Also, those two aren't going to match up. I mean, if you follow a zero by a one, it well, you have zero one, which will be, which will be interpreted as a zero. Then you'll have a one zero, which will be interpreted as a one. You have to be reading from the beginning of the stream in order to keep them. Know the difference between zero and one. Yep. You can't just yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. So there's border case. There's fence. There's the, the border cases. And I mean, if some of these, sometimes you can put. Uh, I mean, some some of the ways, like in FM, when you're thinking about FM radio, you have a carrier wave that you can sync on. Um, but there's, I mean, this is a very simple way to, to to get around this problem. There are other ways, and there's probably papers you can pick up off the internet that show you, you know, someone's newest, cleverest ways, clever way to do this. Um, one other thing, if you want to think about these links, um, there's this, the, if you think about, remember this, you've heard about modems and how people were saying, I think it was either 288 or 336 was the highest they could ever go theoretically, and then they're able to go above that. And there's all these tricks that people actually play with how you encode signals on on the link. So just just very quickly, there's, um, there's, there's really two components. One is how many of these pulses, so to speak, you can put on 
and like how fast you can put a pulse on. Second is um, how uh, how many how much information you can store in each pulse. So for example, suppose that you can store suppose that you have a, a line where you can only put 300 per second of these, 300 baud, 300 you know pulses per second. Imagine that each pulse though could encode four bits. Then in essence you get four you get 1200 baud three times or 1200 bps over this 300 baud line. So there's a lot of you know there's a lot of interesting tricks you can play to do that. Now remember as as the line gets longer it's harder to differentiate at which you, you know which how you uh, which voltage level you encoded each thing. So imagine if um, zero zero volts is meant meant zero um, two volts meant Let's see, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And I'm just picking r random numbers here for the voltages. Um, so each, if each pulse, imagine if the pulse was zero, that, that would correspond to two bits of zero. If the pulse was at two volts, it would correspond to this, and so on. The problem that you have in that case is as, as the line gets longer, then, then this gets attenuated, and it becomes harder to resolve between these. So there's a, there's a distance issue, but in any case, th this is the kind of fun stuff. If you really are into this kind of, there's there's people at MIT uh, that that know a heck of a lot about this type of different types of, of codes that you can use to encode lots of information in in a data stream. Okay. Um, one other thing that you have to do. So we were talking about, you brought up the issue of, of uh, the beginning and the end of these, of, of packets, or of the whole stream, right? There's also the issue of the beginning and the end of a packet. If the packets are variable length, right, how do you know where one starts and the other one begins? Because right, you're just getting this stream of things. Where's the, where's, what do you use as a marker? Headers. Pardon? Do they have headers? They have headers, but how do you know where, where the header is? You know, how, the header says how long its packet is, then at the end of... But how do you know how long the header is? Standard. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, I'm, no, these are... That, you, you, you're, doing, you're doing well so far. <laughs> you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, you're doing, you're doing well. You're doing well. So you're solving one... You're reducing the problem into another one. That's really good. So... Yeah, at the lowest layer, the, at the lowest layer, so at the, when you get finally when to the to the very end of that argument, you say, well, how do I, I? At some point, I need to differentiate the start and end of something, and the way one way that you do that is um, you pick a string of of bits to say here, this is going to mark the the start of the end. So let's say you pick six ones, and you say whenever you see six ones. That marks the start of a packet. So then your header is going to come after that, and then that can tell you something about the pack, you know, every, every, every the payload and so on. Now, what's the problem if we just left it at this? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a good chance that six ones will show up somewhere in the data stream at some point. So one of the techniques that's used in this case to get around that problem is called bit stuffing. And what you do is, anytime you see a set of six ones at the sender side. So when the sender's processing this, anytime it sees six ones that are part of the data, what it does is it inserts a zero after that. And at, on the receiving side, anytime it sees a set of six ones, if the next bit is a zero, it's going to assume that it was bit stuffed, so it X's it out. And if the seventh one is a one, then it's going to say, okay, this was the this this is the mark this is the mark of the beginning of my packet. So it's essentially like using seven. escape characters. Yeah, so it's the beginning it's, of your data packet can't start with a zero. The beginning of your data no, it can, because now anything that's over here is your data packet if it's if it's a one. So, but if but if the first if the first bit of your packet body is a zero, then then this will be a zero right here. Then that one so would you be have there. to stuff a one You'd in. Have six ones. Yeah, you would stuff a you would stuff a one in there also. If it, I mean, basically, if you see if yeah, if you see six ones on the sender side that are part of the packet before you send it, you put a zero in there, and the header for the header you put a you put a one in there. So the, the headers, sort of like the header is a seven. The header then becomes ends up being seven ones. That's how it's recognized at the so at the you, end. And then, and so the header is seven ones, and you never allow seven ones to be. That's right. Otherwise. That's right. You never allow seven ones. So nowhere in the packet can you have seven ones. 
because they break it up. They break it up because remember when you see six ones, you always put a zero in. You always stuff a zero. So. Oh, the packet will probably, you can def, you can define in here how long the packet's gonna be. That could be one of the, one of the, uh, parameters. When, and when you get to the end of the packet, then you just wait to see another string of, what ends up being seven ones as the receiver. Okay, but what I'm asking is what if the packet has six ones in the middle of the packet somewhere? So if the packet has six ones in the middle of it, you stuff a zero at, into that packet. At that, at the, after the sixth one. So you kind of make room, you put a zero in, and, and you do that for the whole packet. So there's, let, let's talk about it after class and I'll show you, like we can go through a concrete example. This, this kind of thing is important because this is, I mean, this is one of the key characteristics of how you, well, an approach to doing this kind of link layer communication. Um, Typically at the link layer, there's also the notion of some kind of error correction, uh, or, or sorry, error detection, which is that you'll have a checksum at the end of each packet. Uh, do you guys all know what a checksum is? Who can tell me what a checksum is? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Is the, the probability that you get the same number from a different string of bits is really, really low. Yeah. So in the, in the simplest, the simplest form of a check sum, and that's why I call it a sum, is you take, um, you take, you, you divide the packet up into, let's say you want a check sum that's, uh, that's, uh, 16 bits. You can break this, you can break this packet up into chunks of 16 bits and add them all together. And whatever the lowest 16 bits are at that point, that's your check sum. So if a bit changes in the packet, then the checksum will be different than the you hope <laughs> than than the than what's uh, the, than what's in the packet itself. Now, because you're reducing the information in the packet to something that's less, you won't always be able to detect errors, and that's because there can be multiple multiple packets with different data that all have the same checksum. Does that make intuitive sense? If your packet say is 64 bits. And you're using 16 bits of checksum, right? Then there's, then there's, then how many pack, how many of, how many groups of these are there? Two to the 64 minus 16. Well, yeah, you're d basically dividing this 64 bit, the 64 bit space into, into blobs of 16 bits, right? So there's going to be this many of them. Um, so uh, this many of them per blob. That, that can that can add up to the same checksum, but the point is is that you don't want to. The, the point of all this is you want to have some kind of error checking mechanism, and the I mean, in the, if you want some perfect mechanism, it's usually hard to get. But um, you don't want the checksum to be some huge piece of take up some huge amount of the bandwidth of this of this link. So typically, at this low level, you have some amount of of error detection, but it's not a lot. If you demand, if you if you require more error detection, you can build it up at a different layer. Okay, and the, in the papers that you're reading, you'll you'll um, see that there are people building some of this stuff up in the in the higher layers. But at this, and in fact, you can do things like error correction, and you can have error correcting codes. Do you guys do anything with error correcting codes in the algorithms? There's there's ways there's algorithms you can use to compute a code. That allows you to, if if um, if you detect an error, it allows you to correct it, in some cases. And depending on how you design it and how many bits you allow an error correcting code, it allows you, it gives you more leeway into how many bits you can actually fix if you detect an, that something's uh, wrong. So one thing that the link layer has to provide is, uh, you know, we have this abstraction, sending stuff from one to the other. We, imp we have some implementation, phase lock loops, bit stuffing, that kind of thing. Um, great. So what do we do now? Well, we have to provide an interface to the next layer up, which is our network layer. And what do we need to provide? We need to give the link, the network layer, uh, the ability to multiplex this link. So to be able to send messages, lots of different types of messages on it. And also to allow it, these messages to have, to be of different network layer type protocols. So at the next layer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the other way around. You need to allow, the link layer has to allow the network layer to abstract over the types of protocols being used by the link layer. You can also have a wireless protocol. You can have 
Um, I mean, some people are talking about sending uh, messages through the ocean, through sound waves. I mean, there's all sorts of different types of link layer protocols. But at the network layer, you need to abstract that all away so it seems like, okay, here's a link. And there's, there's, there's two boxes and there's a link. Um, now, some of the transmission properties, for example, that you may have that make uh, different uh, link layers uh, different is, um, is uh, goes around what kind of uh, transmission and receiving equipment you have on each side of the line. So if you have a line and you have on one end, all you have is a uh, send, uh, send a transmitter on one side and a receiver on the other, that's called a simplex line. If you have a line that has a transceiver on both sides, so a transmitter and a receiver, that's called a duplex line. Now, a duplex line where, the tra where both ends can transmit and receive at the same time is called full duplex. A duplex line where only one person can be transmitting at a time and therefore receiving at a time is called a half duplex. So that's like a walkie-talkie would be half duplex. Walkie-talkies is... is uh, is, half, is, is typically half duplex because you can't actually have two people talking at the same time, but it's gibberish. Typic I mean, it's, it's hard to, to pull it out. And phone is full duplex. Phones are full duplex. Now, I don't know if you guys ever remember using half duplex modems. And that they used to, the modems used to be half duplex. You could just send one way or the other. Um, some, of the, if, some of the network cards that you buy are half duplex, especially the 10 base T, the 10 megabit per second Ethernet cards. Some of them are only half duplex. It's cheaper that way. Um, let me think of, I mean, when you connect up to, like for my uh, Roadrunner service at home, uh, the, uh, the connection to the network is half duplex. If, you try to, if, you, if I try to switch my network card to full duplex, it gets very unhappy. So you'll never be able to do a two-way conversation. At the simultaneously. Although that's at a very, very low level. So, I mean, in terms of like, you could, you could implement a full duplex voice over a half duplex because it can switch really fast. Yeah, if you try to, if you do, right, if you do time level multiplexing over a fast link, you can simulate what seem, what appears to be the, to the person as full duplex. Okay. So these are the different, this is another dimension of the types of links that you want to abstract over in the network. The network layer doesn't want to know whether you're on a, on a what kind of half duplex or, or full duplex and where those are in the net. And, you know, it doesn't want to know any of that. The network layer just wants to see two components and, and a way and a link that you can transmit and receive information on. And all of these things like, for example, your start signal, um, the two potential frequencies you might have to, to, to uh, implement full duplex on one wire. Are all of those things completely shared in the protocols we've seen earlier? Well, there, those are at the, the, at the physical layer. There's a proto there are protocols or standards right. that you have to abide by. So if you're going to build, for example, a, a 100 base T, a 10, 100 base T Ethernet card, there's a document that you can pick up that says, you know, what frequencies you can transmit on, when you can and can't, when and the back off algorithm you have to use, how you address. You know, there's all sorts of that information, and you can build one of these because it's open. Uh, but that's when you connect these two together. You, that's one you have to use, you know, one protocol. When you connect these two together, you might be using something different, uh, and it could be the same machine having two different types of of cards. So an example of that is is your machine that gets the that gets say a, a signal in from Roadrunner and has a wireless card also that it uses to serve lo a local area. Two very different protocols, but to the network, there it doesn't know that one's necessarily that one's wireless and one's the other one. It just says they're both places that I can send and receive to. So this store and forward that we talked about earlier. That's all something that's implemented at the network layer. Okay, so the network layer has there's there's a protocol around being able to receive and being able to figure out where to send to next and and knowing when you get to the end to, to you know to shoot it out to the right place. That's all something at the network layer that, that where you implement at the network layer. 
it, it's made more simple by the fact that you, the network layer software sees the uh, the link layer soft link layer is just a bunch of is basically this a graph. And so one thing that you have to do, one important thing that you have to do with the network layer is to decide how to route these packets. So when one gets injected here, you have to decide: to, do I send it here, here, or here? It's not. A, I mean, in this case, if all the links links were of equal type and had equal uh, congestion, the answer might be: oh, send it here, then here, then here. But if this link was heavily congested, and and maybe this is a modem link, and this these are all T1 lines, then this might be the way to send it. It might be faster that way. So the routing is something that's that's difficult, that's non-trivial, uh, but it's something that you have to worry about at the network layer. Um, and once a layer, once a uh, once the network layer delivers the packet to the to the destination, then that that message then has to be pushed up and given to some to something to a, your program or whatever it is that's running at the next uh, layer in the in the layer infrastructure. So the way to think of all this is that the lowest is, is that when the messages come through, you have your you have your layers. You might have more if you depending on on what you have. So when, at the sender side, you give something to one layer, it gives it to the next, it gives it to the next until you're finally down at the link layer, which then sends it over to to gets it over to where it's supposed to go, and then it goes all the way up. And they may have, uh, I mean, there may be several links along the way and so on, but this is the way, when you're thinking about how these, how, how you design the interfaces to the, these different layers, this is the way to think of it. One layer will give it to, will either send a message up or down. And when it gets down to the link layer, then because there's, the, there's no more down in a sense, then you just have, that's, that's when you send it off to the next link. If you're, if you're just, if you're routing here, then maybe the way this looks like is, it goes up to the next network layer, which sends it at, on the next machine. Um, sorry, it goes to the link layer on the next machine, goes up to the network layer, which sends it back down to the network layer onto the next one, and so on until you finally get to the to the very end. So one of the one of the big issues around implementing the network layer is how you do routing. Okay, so routing is. The, the basic question is, once I have a packet, where do I send it to next? Optimizing routing of packets through this network is non-trivial, especially if you want to, if you want to have a strong of a, uh, if you want to make your best effort at getting all the packets to their destination uh, on, uh, within a uh, reasonable amount of latency intact. So one, one approach to do this is to have every one of these packet switchers have a linear routing table. Which is a table that that maps. Here, I'll erase this. So, linear routing table might be something that says, okay, well, here's the destination. Then here's the uh, the packet switch that I'm going to send it to. So, if my destination is, let's call this Z, um, and I'm and I'm right here, then you might say, well, if I'm going to send it to Z, I always send it to um, no beta. So then that would be for destination Z, send it to beta. All right, for destination Y, send it to beta. So you can have, here's, you know, this is the most simplistic way to do it, is to just have at every point here some kind of linear routing table that tells you for any, any potential, any possible, any possible uh, uh, destination, here's how I do it. Now what's the problem with this approach? Static is one, which is that as connections change, as congestion changes, um, you, you know, the, if this is a static table, then it's not going to take that into account. If it's not a static table, then you have to be trying to update this thing all the time, and it gets very complicated. But just think about the internet. Do you think this kind of thing? It's huge. Like, how big is this table going to be? I mean, it has to have everything out there. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it just wouldn't work. So um, what the internet does is, is it actually brings in one of our friends, our, our friends for reducing complexity, which is hierarchy. Um, so uh, what the internet uses, if you guys, you guys have all seen IP addresses, right? <laughs> 
So an IP address is composed of four 8-bit parts. And what happens is that each of these, when you're routing a message to one of these, what you say is, OK, what I'm going to do is, if I'm at a different, let's, let's just take the outermost one first. The way to think of the, this, this type of hierarchy is that you're, imagine that I, you're on some big network where you have, um, that has 256 nodes on it, which is 8 bits. And so on. Uh, so the, what the algorithm you use is you say, okay, well, if I'm, say I'm here, or, or somewhere in so, somewhere in here in this part of the network, which and there's lots of other branches here. Say I'm part of this network and I want to route something to three dot something. What I'm going to do first is just route it over to the closest three, whoever's the whoever's the, whoever's three that I can get it to the closest. Boom. So now instead of having this huge table with everybody, you have to know, you basically, your table goes down. If you're one of these guys, you have to know where these other guys, where these 256 other guys are. Now let's say you get it over to someone on three. Then your job is you say, oh, well, I'm already at three. And out here, there's 256, you know, more, the, the more possible numbers that are, that flow into this one. So let's say this is 20. So now you say, am I, am I at 20 or not? And if you are, then you're like, oh, okay, great. Then I have to, then you keep going down. And if not, then you send it to whoever's someone out there that will, that's within that subnet that's, that's got that address of 20, that can respond to that address of 20. So there's a hierarchy now. Now you don't, your, your tables don't have to be this as expansive. Uh, it's a lot more manageable. Um, there are some trade-offs, which you should probably think about. But the main, the key here is that you've reduced the complexity by using this, this hierarchical system. Now, one of the one of the more interesting trade-offs is that when this system was developed, this seemed like a lot, right? I mean, how, what is this? Eight, th 32 bits, right? How many is that? That's four four gigs, four billion addresses. Well, guess what? <laughs> We're running out. We've run out, actually. Um, and and this is I mean, this is a huge problem, right? You can't run out. Of, you shouldn't be able to run out of these. So Internet 2 is supposed to address that. You're, I, I believe they're going up to 128 bit addresses, um, which should last us a long time. Who knows? But one of the things that you do, one of the reasons that this has been, uh, that, that this we've been running out is that these high level, these top level domains here, some of them are very underutilized. So who got these? Well, some, MIT. MIT. <laughs> Right. Anyone who's anyone who funded or, or did research on the original DARPAnet, which became the Internet, probably is like is, you know is likely they have something here. They may have sold it at some point, or if they went out of business, you know, it might have been divided up. But there are not a lot of these that you know, I mean that that uh, around. There's only 256. Yeah, MIT. MIT's is um, oh, what is it? It's um, no, it's um. And I used to know it off the top of my head. You can look it up. You so can do an NS lookup. No well, MIT controls it. Okay. MIT will control it, uh, and MIT can decide, you know, who gets who, what, what to do with the rest of this space out here. So, you know, MIT could could sell some of these off, right? They could sell there's you know dot one off to somebody else, uh, and. The problem, though, comes in is, you know, you ha you're trying to set up a little a local area network here. What addresses do you give these machines? And uh, so there's this thing called network address translation, or NAT, that's used. Um, there's, uh, there's also this, th 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 I can point you to some NAT papers. This, this kind of stuff is, is cool if you like this, this kind of addressing thing. But the idea is that you fake, you end up coming up with some way of proxying or faking uh, the addresses of all of these machines. So a machine might have uh, an address like 192, let's say it has a, a class C address, 192, 168, 0, 150. And what will happen if that's your, the, I, the IP address of your machine, uh, out, outside of, of you know, out anywhere on the Internet, if someone types this in, they're never going to get to your machine. But what happens is that your machine will be behind some kind of router or some, some other uh, machine that, like a Linux box that implements NAT, and that machine will act as a proxy for you. 
So it'll what it'll do is that machine will take will take your messages, will take messages from a bunch of other machines, and then it'll put them out there, and it'll know when it gets messages back where to subroute them within its within its uh, shorter network. And there's a there's some issues with this because NAT doesn't work well with with everything that's out there. Uh, but this is the kind of kludge that people have had to come up with in order to deal with the fact that these four giga address addresses are now, I mean, it's, it's, you can't just go out there and just grab whatever you want. It's very well structured out now. Um, the uh, approach that you laid out for finding mm -hmm. the way eventually mm -hmm. to the destination seems like it would work really well for the low end bits. But the upper end bits, you've got no guarantee that finding three, for example, is going to get you any closer geographically. You're going to do a lot of roundabout ways. If that's Geographical uh, implications are, are huge right now, especially with mobile computing. Uh, so imagine that you're, I mean, imagine you have a laptop and you're going, in, in the best case, say you're connected everywhere. And if you have something, I mean, if these were geographically co-located, then that that would give that would improve the chances uh, that you know getting it to one of these machines would get it close closer to you. But if you have a machine, suppose you have a laptop, and do you give it? And I mean, that's a big question: is what a, what kind of how do you address that laptop? Do you want to? I'm, I'm thinking as much where you are in relation to the uh, backbone uh, backbones of the internet. I mean, theoretically. Finding three could send you all the way down the other end of the backbone, yeah. and then you would have yeah. to work your way back up it. So there's so there's a lot of um, I mean these these tables uh, there's a, people are I mean these tables shouldn't be static for that reason. Uh, if you're upgrading links or if links go down or if you I mean ideally you should have these tables change over time as links go up or down. Um, and in fact you could probably see that by doing trace routes. If you do a trace route today, it might be different than a trace route tomorrow. And that has to do with all the way down the line, even at the top level domains, there's constantly optimizations that have to be done because links can go up and down and links can get congested and there's maintenance and you can't guarantee that a link's you know, always going to be up. Now, there are some links that are a lot more critical than others. Right? There's these main trunks that go across the US and there's trunks that go across to, to Europe and those are pretty critical. Um, and but you know, if, if one of those goes down, then doesn't you know you're hosed anyway, right? You might want to go all the try to go around some other way, but it's again there's a lot of I mean I, I don't know the specifics of how the inter, of how these routing tables are up, uh, updated on the internet. There's probably some good papers out there that will explain that, uh, but the the main idea is that if you use a hierarchy like this, you get you can get rid of a lot of the complexity, and that's the starting place for how you do that. Okay. So who's responsible? Well, this is funny. The internet. I mean, everyone thinks of it as like this, this you know, big entity, right? That's ever that's that's just everyone's kind of merry and happy and happily getting along. But it's actually um, there's actually a lot of fights that go on. Um, what I do know about the the you know the internet is that it was it wasn't built by any one person. You know, initially there's a lot of government funding, but a lot of the telephone companies have put money into it, which means you guys have put money into it indirectly. Um, there's parts of it that are outside of the U.S. where it's, who knows, it's government, private, whatever. Uh, but what it ends up being is all these folks have, a, have certain protocols that they abide by, and they also, where they have, so they have all these links that go from place to place, and they have these agreements where these links come to join. So there's, um, there's, this, there's these places, I think they changed the names of them, used to call May West and May East, which are two of the locations on the east and west coast where a lot of these you know, MCI sprints, a lot of these providers, all their, their main trunks all come into this one big center, and then the data gets exchanged, and you know, and, and it can can go back out. Um, now at those places, there's uh, all this controversy because imagine right now the right now the agreement is that if I join one of these, then whatever traffic I put on that I put on t and you know I give to somebody else. They're going to take for free, and whatever traffic they give me, I'm going to distribute it in my, you know, using my network for free. Um, and so you can imagine this would work great if you were if the same amount of traffic you were putting in was I mean if your the amount of traffic you put in was similar to the amount of traffic you were taking out. 
Um, but that isn't always true. If you're one of these fly-by-night ISPs, right? Maybe you want to hook yourself in there and just start injecting a lot of stuff and and not taking a lot of stuff. Um, so there, there's controversies like that uh, that come into play. Um, there's also, you know, who owns that, you know, the the facilities and who manages them. You know, and the, all sorts of fights break out over this kind of thing. Uh, but what, one of the funny things, the implications of this is that people do what's called hot potato routing, which is whenever you get a pack, a packet, and it's on, let's say you're on the GTE network, what you do is you set up this table so that you, you find the closest point that you can give it to somebody else, right? And you're, so your goal is to keep, to try to just anything that you get, just to try to give to somebody else, and, and, be, and, and that way you, your uh, network utilization goes down. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have the best route, you know, from, from packet from one end to the other. So this causes, you know, all sorts of issues if you're on an IS, on a particular ISP and you're getting bad service. It may not be anything to do with your ISP because if you're, say, on MCI, then you, they own some trunks. Once something gets to M, the MCI network and you're on it, that's destined for you, they're, they're incented to try to get it to you as fast as, you know, as best they, as fast and as best they can because then you get better service and it, you, the network utilization goes down. But if somewhere else there's all this hot potato routing going on because the site you're accessing is, uh, you know, who knows where, then you might get really bad service. And it, and it, and it has nothing to do with this, you know, with this great fiber optic network that your ISP may have. Uh, so it's, it's more of a federation than it is, uh, I mean, it, it could fall apart at any moment if all these companies decide they're going to stop uh, routing each other's traffic. Then we're going to have huge network outages. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's why this, this this system is this thing that I described here is a very simplistic way to look at it because when you look when you really when you look at it in practice, there's all sorts of politics that come into play that have little to do with optimizing the the a packet going from one place to another. I think isn't Akamai's business model precisely based on the discrepancy between the theoretical simplicity of every server or whatever having this table and and the fact that it doesn't match onto the what the physical backgrounds are? Yeah, their their model is based. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, their model that it came about. Uh, there are some folks, uh, Tom Layton and and uh, some of his students and some other folks at MIT who um, came up with these routing algorithms that try to optimize getting data from one point to the other. And then they had this idea about putting uh, caching data you know, at the fringes. And what, what it turns out is that their, their business model is actually based on a couple things. One is that when they go out there and they need to buy bandwidth, right? And what they do is they buy bandwidth at wholesale. And then they'll resell it to you at retail. At least that's the idea. Um, and so that, that's, that's a, big, a big piece of it. And another one is, is uh, how they actually decide which of their server farms to send you something, to send you a packet from. So what, that, what they do with that is when you ask for, for, a pa- for something that's Akamized, you'll get back from, you'll have, a na- you'll have some, some name that's mumble.akamai, right? And what, when, that, when that gets resolved by Akamai, they'll give you an IP address. And that IP address is the one that supposedly closest to you that's most local to you. Now, they're one of their, so one of their core competencies is being able to dynamically update all their DNS tables, all their name tables, so that whenever they give you back an IP address, it happens to be the one that's closest to you. And it could happen, I mean, that stuff could happen probably within a session, I would, I would expect. You know, you might get some stuff from, from one page, from one, from one Akamai server and another from another. Um, and so this is why, tying this to something else that we talked about recently, this is why Microsoft, remember when they had this denial of attack, or the denial of service attack, uh, one, one of the ones they, they recently had, was um, actually what happened was their DNS servers got attacked. And so the DNS servers couldn't give you back the IP address that Microsoft.com corresponded to. So th- one of the things I, I read about is that they went to Akamai, and now they're, they, they've, they're trying to work out this deal so Akamai will be their DNS server. So it's not necessarily doing the data piece of it uh, for, the, for this purpose. It's doing, I mean, maybe that's in there, but the main reason they went to them was because Akamai has these DNS, I mean, it has this DNS infrastructure all over the place. And so to attack all of it at once is a much more difficult problem than to attack you know, a handful of Microsoft DNS servers. 
that makes sense? Okay. Um, that's it for today.